Have you uh, have you ever felt help, hopeless before? I uh, when I was a small child, uh, our family used to go to this place. Some of you remember this restaurant called K and W. Anybody remember K and W cafeterias? Okay. Uh, we just told our age when we said that because I think most of them are gone now. But um, this K and W was actually inside of a mall, and um, so my family had went to K and W to eat, and it's a really cool restaurant. I don't know why they died out because literally you go through and there's like 50 items, and you could say, "I want that one, that one, that one, that one, that one." How many ever things you want? And each little thing and each little dish is just a little bit of money. And um, so we had gone there to eat. Always got baked spaghetti. Mac- mashed potatoes and gravy and macaroni and cheese. Doesn't that sound like a good healthy meal? Yeah, if I was carb loading for a fight, I guess. I don't know. But um, but we used to go there and eat. And so we went through one um, evening and uh, got all of our food, sit down and ate. And then we would go out into the mall and shop a little bit. And uh, while we were out into the mall, um, my stomach started rumbling. Do you ever have that happen? Um, you're somewhere most inconvenient place you could probably be, and your stomach starts grumbling and rumbling and then speaking to you. And... Um, I knew I needed to get back to uh, uh, the bathroom at K&W, and so somehow I convinced my mom, Mom, I know where it's at, I can go, and Mom, let me go. Now, this is the 70s, and so there weren't some of the, the fears that we have today of letting our children just go walk through the mall, uh, but she let me go, and I went back to K&W and took care of all that and came back out, and somehow when I came out... I got all turned around. I don't know if I was supposed to go right and I went left or went that way and went that way. I don't remember, but I got turned around and I got lost in the mall. And again, in the 70s, it wasn't like there was a security guard on every station of the the mall. And so there was nobody to really run up to. And so I literally was just walking around the mall, small little kid, uh, lost. And when you're a small, when you're a small kid, or really maybe anybody, but when you're lost, lost, like you know you're lost, that is a very hopeless feeling. You get very anxious. Your heart starts racing. You start looking right and left, just just constantly trying to find my parents. And I did find them. And I don't know how long I was lost. It may have been five minutes. It may have been thirty minutes. But to me, it seemed like forever. I mean, to me, I was scared. I, I, I didn't know where they were. Now, what I came to find out is my mom had been standing outside of the restaurant waiting for me to come out, but I had gone out another door. She was waiting for me to come out this door. And so that's how I sort of got lost for however long I did. But when you are lost, you feel very hopeless. Maybe you've been lost before and you can sort of relate to that story because you say, you know what, I remember what it was like. Maybe I was out in the woods and got turned around. Maybe I was out somewhere and, you know, got lost. And of course, if you're a guy, you're, you're not going to ask directions anyway, uh, if you're on the highway or something. But, but maybe you've gotten lost before. So you understand that, um, story. Maybe you have felt hopeless at some point in your life when you just thought, hey, things are not going to turn around for me. Things are, are not going well for me. Things are, maybe it's a relationship, or maybe it was an addiction, or maybe it was a, a struggle or a habit you were trying to break, and, and you just felt hopeless because you would try and fail and try and fail and try and fail. And then at some point you would just say, it just isn't going to happen. Maybe you felt hopeless like that before. Maybe... Maybe you walked in here today sort of feeling hopeless. Again, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job situation. Maybe it's a, uh, uh, an addiction or a habit that you're wrestling with. But maybe you came in here today feeling hopeless. You know, it's amazing to me, but it isn't, shouldn't be surprising to me that even though Christmas is one of those times when we sing a lot of songs and there seems to be a lot of cheer and there seems to be a lot of pep in people's lives that did you know that from thanksgiving to the end of the year is one of the most depressing times of the year for a lot of people for a lot of people they don't get any joy out of singing joy to the world because they feel hopeless they don't get a, a an excitement over when some of sometimes we may say hey the whole family's coming over for some people that just doesn't excite them because they feel hopeless 
And so part of what we're going to do during this Christmas series is we're going to talk about the fact that during Christmas, we celebrate the fact that hope has come alive. Hope has come alive. And so if you're here today and you walked in here with a struggle, you walked in here feeling hopeless, you walked in here with just, is it going to work out for me? I want you to know that hope has come alive. And throughout the next four weeks as we build up sort of to our, our Christmas candlelight service, as we build up through this Christmas season, we're going to look at different words throughout the Scripture, different words from different people involved in the Christmas story. And they all point to the fact, they all boils down to the fact that hope has come alive. Hope came alive for me as a little boy when I found my mom that day. And hope came alive for me spiritually the day that I went forward and gave my life to Christ. And maybe you've never been lost in the mall, and if, that, and if you never have, then congratulations. Then again, maybe you never made that commitment of your life to Christ either. And I want to tell you that hope has come alive. And that's what we celebrate during this Christmas season. That's why we're here. That's why we can sing joy, unspeakable joy, because hope has come alive. I don't know if you guys realize this or not. I just said it a minute ago. But because uh, this time of year is one of the most depressing times of year, that's the very reason we're having two candlelight services on December 21st. You see, there's people around you. There are neighbors. There are co-workers. Family members. Many of them are waiting for an invitation. This is the second best time out of the entire year that you can invite somebody to church. Easter's the first, Christmas is the second. So during this month, there's an opportunity for you to reach out to those people you work with, those people you live next to, those people that are in your family, that, and maybe even people you've wanted to invite before, or maybe even people you have invited before. So I want to encourage you to invite your family and your friends and your neighbors to those candlelight services on the 21st because we are looking at the fact that hope has come alive. Today what I want to do is a little different. I want to look at Christmas from the historical perspective. From the historical perspective because I want to look at the words of the prophets. I don't know if you know this or not, again, it's a little bit of a history lesson. There are 365 Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Now let me just break, break down what it means to be a Messianic prophecy. The words Messiah, the word Messiah means deliverer. Okay, deliverer. And the word prophecy means to speak into the future. And so there are 365 individual prophecies about this deliverer that was coming. Now, that might not mean a whole lot to you today in 2014, but to the people of that day, to the people of the Old Testament, to the nation of Israel, they were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for this one that was going to come because of their disobedience, they were in captivity. Because of their disobedience to God, they were in slavery. Because of their disobedience, they were in exile. And so when the words from the prophets come that, hey, a deliverer is coming, they were looking for the deliverer like right now. Like in the next seven minutes, is he going to be here? In the next seven hours? I mean, is he like around the corner? And the reality is for many of the prophets, the, Jesus was not even coming for, for 500 years or 700 years in the case of Isaiah that we're going to look here. But when they said, when Isaiah talked about this deliverer that was coming, the people perked their ears up because the people were looking for a deliverer. 365 messianic prophecies. Now it would be, you might, you might would say, maybe this could happen. If, if I could pull any random person out of the crowd, and let, let's say even just to make it more realistic, somebody I didn't know. I know a lot of you that are here today, but, but there's a few that I don't know. And say I pulled you up on stage here, and I could say, look, I'm going to tell you five things about yourself that's going to happen five years from now. And, I, and maybe a young lady, and I say, look, you're going to marry a guy, and his name's going to be Joe. And you're going to have two girls, and their names are going to be Susie and Martha. And you're going to be working for uh, GE 
electronics and you're going to live in, and I just did those kinds of things, and five years from now, what do you think the probability of those things happening? Very, very little. Well, we talk about messianic prophecies. That's part of what happened is these, the, the, these prophets were foretelling something that was going to happen 700 years later. And so a lot of times during this year, a lot of the people you may talk to will come up and say, well, all of that was just coincidence. All of that just, you know, some things fell into place, some things happened, but it really wasn't God doing it. It really wasn't God's story working it out. It was just a, a, a happenstance, something that happened. I have a video that I love to share every time when I talk about these prophecies because it shows the probability that all of these 365 prophecies would be fulfilled by one person and one person alone. Some of you will love the, the little tune that goes along with the video, but... How do you know what's true is really true? That's where the evidence comes in. Christ's offer to turn you into a new person is real, if his claim to be God is true. So let's consider the evidence of eight prophecies proving his claim is true. Do you know what the probability factor is of only eight prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus? No. One in ten to the seventeenth power. One in ten to the seventeenth power! Huh? That's one in ten to this many times. I don't get it. If you were to take ten to the seventeenth power Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies... How many? That's over a quintillion cookies! and spread them across the state of Texas, Yeehaw! they would cover every inch of the state and form a pile of Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies two feet deep. That's a lot of Thin Mints. A whole lot of Thin Mints. Now take one more Thin Mint and lick all the chocolate off, toss it into that pile and stir the whole thing up. Blindfold yourself, walk the entire state from Amarillo to Laredo, stopping just once to stoop down and pick a single blind Thin Mint cookie. Got it! Take off the blindfold. Aw, uh, nuts. The chances of you picking the chocolateless cookie is the same as the chance that one person could have fulfilled just eight prophecies about Jesus in one lifetime. That's crazy. It's unthinkable. But Jesus Christ did not fulfill eight prophecies in one lifetime. Whoa. He fulfilled over 300. 300, girl! Whoa. And 29 of them in just one day. The prophecies are historically documented. The facts that actually happened to Jesus are historically documented. There's only one thing left to do. I know. For me to weigh the evidence. It's all part of the evidence. Because if it is true that he is the Son of God, what he offers you, a new life in him, is real. Now I know it's real, whether I believed it or not. It's all part of the evidence. I don't know if you caught it in the video. Did you realize that that probability was just for eight things to be fulfilled? And yet 365 individual prophecies were made about this deliverer that was coming. This Messiah that was going to be born. And the people were looking for him. I want to, for those of you that love to dig deep, I'm going to direct you to a website. It, it, lists, it lists every messianic prophecy that was made in the Old Testament, and it shows you where it was fulfilled in the New Testament. So if, if you want to dig deeper into that, it's called BibleProbe.com, and you just type in 365 messianic prophecies, and it'll show you again where it's fulfilled in the, where it was prophesied in the Old Testament, but also where it was fulfilled in in the New Testament. And so what I want to do today, all of the prophets made prophecies about the Messiah that was coming. But today what I want to do is look at a couple of the things that Isaiah said. Uh, certainly he made the most prophecies and, and probably made the most well-known prophecies that we read during this Christmas season. And so I want to look at what Isaiah said about this Savior, this Deliverer that was to come 700 years after it was foretold. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1 
It says, Nevertheless, the time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zeb Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee, when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Now, if you go back to chapter 8, you're going to read that what had happened here is Israel had been disobedient to God. And so God had sent word to them through Isaiah that there's a time of trouble coming for you. There, there's a time when you're going to, because you have walked away from me, because you have denied me, because you have stopped following my ways, there's trouble coming your way. And they were going to be take, taken captive. And so part of what Isaiah was telling them here is, you're getting ready to go into trouble, but trouble will not be forever. And that's what he begins to talk about here in Isaiah chapter 9. He says that there will come a day when it will be filled with glory. There's coming a day when your trouble will end. There's coming a day when your punishment will end when, from walking away from me. One of the biggest prophecies that we read during the Christmas season is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. One of the things that Isaiah tells us about this deliverer that is coming, he gives us some names that he will be called. The first thing he says, he's going to be called the Wonderful Counselor. The Wonderful Counselor. Counselor, You know, a lot of us at different times in our lives, we, we go and we talk to someone for counsel. It may be uh, a family member. It may be uh, a pastor. It may be a counselor, those kinds of things. And, and a lot of times we go and we get advice from folks. Well, the one thing that you need to always remember is there's only one counselor that can see the whole story. There's only one counselor that can see the beginning to the end. I may, you may come to me for some advice and want to talk over a situation. I may be able to see just a few details and just a few things that are happening right here. But the reality is there's one counselor, the wonderful counselor in Jesus Christ, who can see the beginning to the end. He says that he's going to be called a mighty God. A mighty God. You know, there are a lot of gods in our life. Some of us have the God of money in our life and we seek after it and we, 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 we hold it precious and we do whatever we can to grab a hold of it. Sometimes we even become greedy in the pursuit of money. Some of us have the God of relationships. And some of us will, will bounce from a relationship to relationship because that is a God in our life. Life. Some of us, I've even seen it, where, where some parents have their children as a God in their life. Where, where they move beyond that I care for them and I love them, but literally they become a God in their life and everything revolves around that child. A lot of us have gods in our lives, but there's coming a day, the Bible tells us, when every knee will bow and everyone will know who the mighty God is says he's going to be called the Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. You know, he is there from the beginning to the end. He's there from the beginning to the end. He's there in your good times and he's there in your bad times. I, I, yesterday I watched a lot of football. It was a great day to watch football. And one of the things that impressed me the most about yesterday was not the winners of the game, but the losers. There's one particular game I was watching, and at the end of the game, it's customary, and they've started this thing where, where a lot of believers that are ball players will meet in midfield and, and have a word of prayer. And it's one thing if you're on the winning team to run to midfield and you're ready to pray because you're all elated, but I watched, and I didn't really realize this, but I watched one person who pretty much had cost his team the game and pretty much made the big error. Probably the low point of his athletic career was yesterday. And yet he was at midfield praying with his teammates and with the opposing teammates. 
He is an everlasting Father. He's there in the good times, and He is there in the bad times. He is there when, when we are having our ups, and He's there when we're having our downs. He's there in our mountaintop experiences. And I know so many of us are so, you know, we recognize Him in the mountaintop, but He's also there in the valley as well. He is an everlasting Father. He does not disappear. He does not run off. He does not turn His back on us. And said he would be called the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. You know, we, we often live in a life of chaos. I, I, because I had confessed on myself a few weeks ago about how I behaved on Black Friday, uh, I, I didn't go Black Friday shopping this year. Uh, there was nothing out there worth to knock somebody over for. Or, there was only one thing, I, only one deal I saw, and it would have been for the church. And I was just like, well, I'm not sure if that's going to look good if the pastor of a church is knocking someone down to get something for the church. So, so I just didn't go. I, I, I refrained. I restrained myself. I didn't go Black Friday shopping. But you know what? There's a lot of chaos and a lot of madness that goes into that. There's people honking horns, and there are people knocking each other over trying to get that deal. Well, sometimes my life seems like Black Friday. I don't know about you. Sometimes I may wake up, and it may go, yeah, it says it's 6 o'clock in the morning, but it already feels like about 10. And sometimes I go through my day, and, and I have it all charted out, and all checklist up, and all ready to go, and this happens, and this happens, and that call, and that call, and that email, and I need to go there, and... Sometimes our lives turn into chaos. And yet He is the Prince of Peace. He's the only one who can bring peace among the chaos. Isaiah went on throughout the whole book of Isaiah to make a lot of different prophecies about this Messiah that was coming. This deliverer. And again, try to think of it from the, the Israelites' perspective. They're waiting on this deliverer. They're waiting to get out of the captivity. They're waiting to get out of the slavery. They are looking for him. And in Isaiah 53, not only is the Messiah's birth foretold, but the Messiah's purpose and even his death is prophesied as well. Isaiah 53, let me just read these, this chapter to you. It has a lot of different prophecies in it. It says, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed His powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about His appearance, nothing to attract us to Him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on Him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it, it was our weaknesses He carried. It was our sorrows that weighed Him down. And we thought His troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment of his, for His own sins. <coughs> but He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants." He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish. He will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. 
I will give him the honor of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, it said. Now here's what's interesting about that. He was born in the lineage of a king. He was born with the heritage of royalty. He was born in David's line. And so if you were born in that day in royalty, if you were born that day in, in, a, in a priestly line or a kingly line, a royalty line, the last thing that would happen to you would be despised and rejected. The last thing that would happen to you is that you would become a man of sorrows. Verse 4 through 12 talk about all of these different ways that, that because of our sin, He took our pain. He took our punishment. He took our sins to the cross for Him. You see, Christmas we celebrate that the Messiah has come, but the Messiah came to deliver, right? He didn't just come to deliver Israel. He came to deliver you and me. It wasn't just the Israelites' sins. It was our sins. It wasn't just the things the Israelites had done wrong. It's the things that I have done wrong. You see, when these messianic prophecies were made by Isaiah, and the people were watching, and the people were looking, because they needed a deliverer. And today I'm here to tell you that we need a deliverer. Because of our sins and the things that we have done, we need a deliverer. The cool thing is that the Israelites spent all of these years looking forward. 700 years from Isaiah's writings to the birth of Christ. A generation was born, a generation watched for the deliverer. And generation after generation came and lived and died, all looking for the deliverer. The cool thing is, you and I get to look back. Instead of having to look forward at the prophecies, you and I look back, and we see not only the prophecies, but we see the fulfillment of the prophecies. We not only see the birth of the Messiah, but we see the death of the Messiah. We not only get excited and can sing joy to the world during Christmas because the Messiah has come, we can sing joy to the world because the Messiah has died for our sins. See, Christmas isn't just about the birth of a Savior. It's about the birth of the Deliverer. It isn't just about some Christmas carols and a, some Christmas decorations and some great time with family. It's about the One who came to deliver you and to deliver me from the punishments of our sins. Sometimes people like to talk about coincidence. They'll say a lot of these prophecies were just coincidence. And I think that's one of the reasons that there were so many. I think if there had been two or three, then people would just be saying, it was just coincidence. It just sort of happens. It just sort of happened that way. It just sort of worked itself out that way. But 365 things, I mean, come on, get real. That probability is, is it going to happen by accident? It was God-ordained. Yesterday, we, um, we had to buy a new Christmas tree this year, and so we took our old tree uh, to Abba House, a uh, thrift store, to give it to, because I figured, hey, there's somebody who's going to maybe buy this tree. Um, and so we took it in there, and here's what's so cool. I, I go to take it in, and Blake was with me, and we, uh, I go in, I said, look, I have a tree. I said, it, it's pre-lit, it has a stand. I said, some of the lights don't work. I said, but but most of them do. 80% of the lights work. And um, so all of a sudden, Terry, and many of you know who Terry is, she just, her eyes just get real big, and she just starts clapping, and she gets all excited. I'm like, look, it's just a tree. I mean, you know. And I said, you know, I just want to donate it, and because I, I figure somebody may want to buy it for cheap and, you know, have it at their house or whatever. She goes, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. She said, we just sold our tree that we had on display. And we're doing a thing for our kids, and so we need another tree. 
So she said, just bring it in. I literally brought it in, and they were starting to just set it up right then. Now see, some people go, well, that was nice. That was a good coincidence. See, I don't think so. See, I think God knew they needed a tree. And I think God somehow put it on our heart to take our old tree there. And, and they took it, and somehow they had sold their other tree, so they made money for that. And then they got another tree to put right back in its place. See, here's the thing I want to emphasize to us. <clears throat> Nothing about this is coincidence. Nothing about this Christmas season just happened. The reality is that years ago, God looked down and He knew there was a problem. He said, there's only one way to solve this problem. So God sent Jesus Christ, His only Son, and He sent Him to this earth, not just for the Israelites that may come to know Him, but He sent Him to this earth for you and for me. And it's not happenstance and it's not accident that you're even here today. He said God wanted you here today. God brought you here today. Maybe it was to hear that hope has come alive for you. Hope doesn't have to be dead. Hope doesn't have to be behind you. Hope doesn't have to be gone. Hope has come alive for you today. And when the Messiah, the Deliverer, was born, He was born with the end in mind. God knew what His end would be. God knew why He was coming. And you and I are that reason. He is our Deliverer. Hope has come alive today for you and for me. Let's pray.